Today, we visit Antioch's, a copper mining ghost town in a remote part of British Columbia, Canada, located on the shores of Granby Bay. In 1910, the Granby Consolidated Mining, Smelting and Power Company, Granby Consolidated, started buying land in the area. It would become one of the largest copper mining operations in the British Empire during this time. Granby Consolidated started construction of the town around 1912 and by 1914 with the mine and smelter in full operation, the town had grown to a population of around 3,000 residents. Ore from the mines was transported by rail to crushers and then processed at a nearby smelter. Health and working conditions were very poor and a major issue. The fumes from the smelter stack were so toxic that the surrounding forest was killed off for many kilometers in all directions around the town. Everyday life was linked to copper prices and as they slumped so would the safety and workplace accidents would increase. The town was remote and served by steamships as there were no road or rail connections to the outside world. That meant the town of 3000 had to be self-sufficient and have all the amenities to attract workers and their families. There was a general store, a post office, hospital, a bank, a movie house and more and every home was heated and had running water. In the early 1920s, a hydroelectric dam was built by engineer John Eastwood to supply electricity to the town and mining operation. It stands at 44 meters tall and at the time of completion was the tallest dam in Canada. For safety reasons, the dam was breached with holes in several locations to allow water flow and to prevent overtopping of the dam after abandonment in 1935. The current owner has plans to refurbish the dam and put it back in use. The Great Depression drove down the demand for copper and was the beginning of the end for Antiochs. Operations continued while the company stockpiled 100 million pounds of copper over the next three years that it was unable to sell. The mine shut down in 1935 and the town was abandoned. Salvage operations in the late 1930s and early 1940s for the war effort removed most machinery and steel. In 1942, there was just a small crew remaining and a fire tore through the town and burned down all remaining wooden structures. In total, Antioch's mines and smelters produced some 140,000 ounces of gold, 8 million ounces of silver, and 760 million pounds of copper. Since 1942, besides a few mining exploration companies that come and go, and a company that mines the smelter slag pile for industrial abrasives, Antioch sits mostly forgotten. The concrete and steel structures that still exist are being reclaimed by nature. Join me on this adventure with my friend Mike and our guide Rob as we explore for two days to discover what remains. There was a stack on that uh, steam plant we drove right in front. But if you look closely, you can see there's a building that's all intact. That was the mess hall. So today I'm in the ghost town of Antioch in British Columbia. And I'm here with Mike, Mike the Urban Explorer, good buddy of mine. We came up here to explore this awesome place. We're here with Rob. He's showing us around. This is the mess hall. It's one of our first stops. You'll see the old stairs right there. It's going to be a pretty big explore. There's lots here to see. Grinder. 
quite a bit left. And let's look at the ceiling. of it then a big building this one here massive building three levels and then if you look right behind you concrete posts out here Twyford's LTD Hanley England pretty big structure They took fire very seriously with all the wood houses, everything. So what they did was they made these fire buckets like this with a point, so they're no use to anybody. So these hung on every corner around town and they had a big barrel of water sitting right below them, but they were always on a hook. So they're no use to anyone to take home because they just oh. tipped over. You put water in it, boom, it falls over. So people wouldn't steal these because, you know, no damage, they're useless. So. But for them, when they're on a hook on the edge of a road, a wooden plank road, now they're valuable. They always had water in it. The kids were taught, don't touch, don't mess with these things. Don't play with them. Yeah, because fire was a serious business around the town. So, yeah. so is that like the, uh, like the stolen light bulbs I heard about? Exactly the same thing. <laughs> the steam plant is located across Falls Creek from powerhouse number one. During cold winter months, Falls Creek water flow was too low to fully power the mine site. This steam plant was built to handle this shortage of power. Yeah, very cool. This place has always looked cool, especially when you see nature taken back over. Like that moss over there. Little trees starting to grow up through. started our tour but it's already just amazing very cool I love seeing all this stuff learning all about the history and Rob's really knowledgeable so this section that we're looking at basically was full of like a, a gyrating crusher a ball mill a rod mill a roll mill so they had uh, six inch rocks came in here. The train tracks were on top of this thing. Trains came in and dumped all their ore in there. And in there would have been a six inch section of rock that came down and they put it into a powder through a series of mills. So same thing they do today. They got big crushing units, gyrating crushers, balls, you know, big steelies. Yeah. And they put rocks in there, you know, and it just pounds it into a powder. And what the concentrator did was take that powder, so the rock powder, took it up there and there's these big flotation ponds in here and you'll see one of them up here and they basically add oxygen from the bottom and then they add cyanide and other chemicals and the cyanide and the oxygen bind to the copper and the gold all the good stuff and then they float it to the surface they scoop it off they dry it and then it gets sent to the smelter and they uh and they burn it off there and that's oh. how you get your copper So there's three train cars that flipped over here down the bank. Flipped upside down. They're still in pretty good condition, actually. So did they have an accident and they just left them? I think? guess. I don't know. Nobody yeah. knows the story. and 
all the bearing hubs. And they cast coking coal. Coal with coal, and they made a real like high premium kind of coal out of it. They burned off a bunch of stuff. Originally, this was a, uh, they put all the dynamite away from the mine and away from the town. And then in between the railway tracks, it was easy access. So we're kind of a ways away from the town, away from the thing. Big steel door there. Okay guys, we're continuing on our tour of Antioch, and we're going up to one of the highlights here, and that's the dam. It's a very impressive structure. The number two hydroelectric dam is located up Falls Creek, roughly five kilometers from the town site and around 2.5 kilometers above the original rock and log crib number one dam. It was built between 1922 and 1924 to meet the demands of more power and water that was needed to operate the new concentrator and other expansions at the site. The number one dam did not have the capacity to hold back enough water in the cold winter months to meet this new demand. They needed this consistent year-round water supply that the new number two dam could now provide. John Eastwood designed and engineered the dam who built the world's first reinforced concrete multiple arch dam at Hume Lake, California in 1908. He sought new ways to innovate and be efficient with minimizing the amount of concrete necessary to reduce costs which was perfect for remote sites such as Antioch's. The Antioch's dam is a remarkable example of this multiple arch design. His designs faced strong opposition from engineers that were advocates for massive gravity dams. Most arguments concerning Eastwood's design did not necessarily focus on technical issues, but more on public confidence in this thin arch design. They believed it did not provide a proper visual assurance of strength. In a 1924 letter, he celebrated the Antioch Dam's performance in withstanding and overtopping through an uncompleted arch. He was proud of the Antioch Dam and had said it was the most beautiful dam in the world. The dam was abandoned in 1935, and as you can see, almost 100 years later, the dam is still standing and intact, which is a testament to this design.
if you guys know me, I don't really care for heights too much. But I actually don't mind this up here. <laughs> Still working. Yeah, it's very impressive for... So when was this built? 1923, 24. Seems like a very unique design too. Just with how the arches are just the curves, isn't it? Or is that... Yeah, it is very unique. This guy was very artistic and Thin concrete was his whole thing, like remote places like this. Yeah. As little concrete as possible, but using all the engineering principles. You can see some stairs down there. And we get earthquakes out here. Yeah, this is an impressive structure. Very cool. Now we're just walking down to the bottom of the dam get a better look at it from down here very impressive structure yeah look at the curves and the construction very unique looking Okay, we're just finishing up here at the dam. We're gonna head on down the road. Yeah, very cool structure. All of Antioch so far is just amazing. There's so much here to explore. Highly recommend coming here on a tour if you can. So, great stuff. So this is one of the tea boxes here. Oh. If you look close, see the little square? There's yeah. There's a piece of wood right here. It kind of comes across here. There's that piece, so there's a square tea box. That's cool. Nine holes. Nine holes. Yeah, oiled uh, greens. Yeah, look at that view. So this is the slag pile. It's left over. There's actually a company that comes in here and takes some of this out still. Very impressive building. Especially when you see some of the pictures from when it was in operation. The inside was just pristine. So here in Antioch, they mined for copper. And it shut down in 1935, I believe. Because the markets collapsed. The price of copper went down. So yeah, this building still has some wood on it. So the fire didn't get this that went through in 1942. It pretty much wiped out the whole town, that fire. All wooden structures were pretty much burnt to the ground. And there was also salvage operations too that came in and removed a lot of metals. Constructed in 1911, Powerhouse No. 1 sits at the base of Falls Creek to take advantage of its water source. The steep hill behind the building was an optimal location for the water pipes and penstocks. This powerhouse provided electricity for the smelter, mining operations, and the town. Very cool look in here. 
just that industrial mixed with nature. Always looks cool. There's Mike up there getting some photos. Trees growing up, moss everywhere. Wow, there's so many valves over here. It's like you don't even really know where to look here. There's so much stuff. Oh, this place is cool. Huge building. Something pretty cool that Rob told us about here. You see the brick on the end here? How oh, there's white brick. And then it changes to the other color. Well, oh, this end here was actually added on at a later date. So they made the building a little bit longer here. I think to fit some of this equipment in here. So this is what's called a Pelton wheel. So water came in there and yeah, spun this generator right here. And back over here, right in the middle there, that's actually a vertical one. Good flow. Very cool, what a place. There's a 15 ton crane. We begin our second day exploring Antioch's first with a look at the general store, built in 1912. It was one of the first buildings built in the town and is one of the first you see as you enter Granby Bay. All that remains today is the concrete shell of the store and scattered artifacts. We will travel along the shore and through the forest towards the remains of the coke plant. We then hike through the town site, stopping at many of the ruins of the buildings and structures of the original town to finally visit the cemetery where many of the town's residents were laid to rest. Okay guys, we're on our second day here in Antioch. We're just walking down the shoreline. This is the old general store. 
and we're on our way to a couple other areas and we'll come back to this one and explore it a little bit better. But here's a quick look. There's all kinds of stuff along this shore. Tons of bottles, pottery. There's just a random spoon. Cool place to come and just look around, see what you can find too. An old ax head. No shortage of artifacts along here. Here's what's left over of one of the fire hydrants. And you'll find many of these just scattered all around. It's cool to see them just in seemingly random places, but they weren't at the time. I didn't realize Antioch was such a big area to explore. Huge area, so much stuff here. But the town had at its peak 3,000 people. They had all the amenities here. Very cool. These buildings just seem to appear out of nowhere. Just everywhere. Very self-sufficient back then. Had everything here. Construction of the coke plant started in 1918 and was completed in 1919. The plant would take coking coal to produce coke for use in the smelter and the auxiliary steam plant. The coking process also created many byproducts, including tar, gas, ammonia, naphthalene, benzol, and others. The smell of some of the byproducts still lingers even today. The plant consisted of 30 brick coke ovens, byproducts building, powerhouse, benzol building, screening and quenching stations, and storage tanks. Today, the building that you see as you enter the bay to Antioch's is the benzol building, and the coke oven stack still stands. At the time this plant was put into operation, it was the most up-to-date coke plant in North America, and the build cost was over $2 million. Wow, what a cool place. Don't even know where to look. There's so much stuff to see.
There is so much to see here. You could literally spend weeks here. And Rob has spent a lot of time out here and he still finds new stuff every time he comes out. That just goes to tell you, so overgrown with so much stuff, things are just hidden everywhere. details in these old buildings. Even in the industrial buildings, they, I don't know, they just had more detail and took more time and care to build. Stuff you don't see nowadays. one of the old stacks. Here's another fire hydrant. Very cool. This battery of 30 coke ovens was constructed by experienced bricklayers from Chicago. Coke is produced by heating coal at high temperatures under reduced oxygen conditions for long periods of time. It is primarily used in steel production, but also as a fuel. Yeah, look down there. It goes the whole way down there. Yeah, this looks so cool in here. These are the kind of places I really like. Man, the work it would have taken the workers back then to build all these structures in this town. And if you look in here, I still have bricks stacked. Yeah, we're doing a little bit of bushwhacking in here to see some of these places. So here we are taking a better look at the general store. It's the place that we saw from the shore, the front side of it there earlier. There's the front there. We're just taking a look at a different angle. some saw blades right here. I mean, this is the inside of the store. <laughs> so no one's really even searched that well in here. Should be all kinds of artifacts in here to find. Another fire hydrant. Yeah, Rob was just saying the tennis courts used to be up in that direction. Most of that stuff 
obviously is no longer around. Imagine this used to be a town, but when you see the fire hydrants and he points out everything, it's pretty crazy. So what's this one? It's the company office. Okay. Yeah, this is a company office and it was a bank at one point. Yeah, look at the detail around some of these windows. There's inside, a bunch of patients, trolleys, which was a couple trolleys back here. Dead frame on the side there too. Yeah, remnants of those. Another shot inside. Wow. The hospital was built in 1912 at the entrance to the old mine road, overlooking the docks. It was one of the most up-to-date for its size in the province. It was completely equipped with the latest equipment and staffed by three doctors. It closed September 1935. That looks like some sort of a cart they would have had. Here you can see where the wheel probably would have been. It's pretty cool, fire hydrant. Oh, cool. And this house here was, uh, I had a whole pile of photos from this guy. Well, he came on one of our tours, one of the first tours we did. His name was Philip Hodgson. He was from Colorado. He was born here. And that was the house that he lived in for the first two years of his life. Wow. He sat right here. So uh, he had all these things with arrows to him. And he said, hey, can we go up and see if we can find where my house was? And I said, well, I mean, we didn't have anything for here. Yeah. I, said, I know where it is, kind of. We'll come up here and look. And it would look just like this. So there's five or six of us went up there. And we found there's four concrete corner posts, there's a chimney, there's bricks from the chimney, all kinds of stuff are lying up oh, in really? there. So yeah, we let him take a brick home <laughs> from his chimney and yeah, he got all emotional and he oh. always wanted to come here. He said he never thought it'd be possible. And then his daughter saw one day that there was a tour to, to Antioch. Oh, this is looking down at the, yeah, at the courts? At the tennis courts. This was the Antioch Hotel right here. Go away. We're sitting right here. It goes down that way. And that goes that way. It's like an L shape. <laughs> the old bank. And we curled up through the hospital. We came back around. There's that fire hydrant. Yep. And we came to Philip Hodgson's house. So there was the um, tennis courts. The hotel it was right here. And then uh, we're just right here now. We're gonna go up, actually we're cutting along here because the fire hydrant's right there. Yeah. So we're gonna cut up this little section here called Hill Street. Yep. And then have a little street, Grandview Avenue. We're not gonna go here, but there's a house in there. And we're gonna go up, we'll see this fire hydrant, and then we're gonna go up, we're gonna cross this line. You'll see that that uh, water line, and then cemetery. Oh, cool. So hmm. this is where we're headed up, oh. out of School Street there. But yeah, i give you an idea. Remember I said we were going to go up this street and there was Grandview Avenue and there was oh, a house yeah. in there. Well, there's the cemetery. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. You, know, you can see all the white crosses. Oh, yeah. We're going to cruise up. In the Quite noticeable on the, yeah. mm. the photo. It's an old telephone pole right there. Chaired. Yeah, there's houses all along here. Hard to believe. Another fire hydrant.
Grave sites were once marked with white wooden crosses, but only a small percentage of the grave sites are marked today. The cemetery records have never been located, and most information was collected from the local newspaper and other sources. Antioch sent many of its workers off to World War I, and those that did return were promised work and would receive a proper burial. He actually fought for the Allied forces under the Serbian flag. It's all in Yugoslavian too, eh? Yeah, it is. Each veteran's grave site is marked with a rectangular concrete outline with four corner posts and a commemorative concrete helmet. I like that most of them are marked pretty good with their names. We have history on them. Antioch's was hit hard with many deaths by one of the world's worst pandemics, the 1918 influenza pandemic. It feels so peaceful here too, so quiet. As our Antioch's exploration nears the end, we still have time to explore some last areas. Our trip wouldn't be complete without exploring where Antioch started, the Hidden Creek Mine. We will hike up the creek and go underground through a collapsed opening into a tunnel of the mine. And then, one more stop before we pack up and make the one hour journey by boat to our next destination. Production of blister copper at its peak was 60 million pounds per year that was shipped to the refinery at Tacoma, Washington. In 1935, the ore reserves of the mine were becoming exhausted, and the price and demand for copper had dropped to an all-time low. This would force the closure of the mine. You can just, you know, feel the cool air too when you get down here. Yeah, I can already feel a little bit here even. so that when the ore cars came by, they just run them by one side, would hit the, uh, yep. the ore car would hit it, it would hinge up, tip over into the chute and go down to the next level. Oh, really? So they invented these, what's huh. cool, it's called the Granby Tipper. It's all, and then it would roll, but keep going and then it would tip back again. So as soon as I get going here, you're gonna not see anything because it'll mop right up, so. Yeah.
The handling of the ore in the mine was by a gravity system. Tracks were laid in the mine on the 150-foot level, under the ore loading chutes, and also on the 230-foot level, which was the same level as the large crushers. 16-ton electric locomotives were used to haul the ore cars from the mine and over the top of the crushers, and then dumped. a level up here, same thing, another at it, and they had a shoot in here with a big lever and he would open up this door and then all the ore would come down into here, into another little ore car, oh, yeah. and then it would go down, I'll show you one here that goes down, and then they would go here and set up the tipper, and it would shoot down into another one at the bottom of that, there'd be another guy here, mm -hmm. you'll see one with some proper handles on it over there, there's kind of a handle there, but they have a guy sitting up here, here's some of the rail line, oh, that's cool. So did they have electricity in here, or is it all like lantern lit? No, it's electric railway. So like they had it. Oh wow. So we're doing that a tipper here. The ore would come along here. They had to get it down to the bottom level where that crusher was on the mountain. And then everything went out to the crusher, so every level got tip, tip, tip. And there'd be a guy sitting down here. Dynamite box. Polar foresight. You see all the cables, eh? You like to put it over here. a diamond bit or something. So cool. Yeah, that's the way we went. Four hours that way. Four hours that way. Jeez. Really? Yeah, half of one level. Holy. So you go right or left here and we just did fingers everywhere. And then came back out. But yeah, we were up to our waist in sludge. But some spots were bare, like just bare gravel. Really? There's a lunch room down here. An elevator shop. There's a little mural of Benito Mussolini. And oh, really? And little rooms, like cut out, all made of wood kind of thing. Yeah, here's the power line right here. Or we get shot down and they take it from here, go up around the corner, send it down that next one until it got to the 150 level, which is where the structure was in an area and got sent out there. So how how deep did they mine? How was the deepest? Way down. Down. I don't even well the 150, I don't know what the other one was like. That's what I mean above us is that town site. You know, the whole thing where they live is up above and the whole mine is in the it. Very cool. This is the Indiana Jones thing here where it just opens up. I always think of that when I a massive cavern. There's Mike way down there. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, yeah. The room's way bigger than it first appears.
a wooden pipe all held together with these rings, so that's all that's left now. It came from this surge tank right here. The surge tank is 180 feet high and acted as a safety relief on the six foot wooden stave penstock to the number one dam. If the water pressure at the power hose had to be reduced or shut off, the water in the penstock would surge up into this tank, relieving the pressure. I think Rob said he followed it three, three and a half kilometers, these rings up through the woods. Wade's gonna do it. Thousand bucks. And I still wouldn't do it. Wow, that's a long ways up there. Not a place I'm gonna go. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know that was a thing, like wooden pipe like this with all these rings. Oh yeah. There's one over here, I'll show you a mini one of this. You can see the wood and how they tongue and grouped it together. in the joiner sections. Crazy. Yeah, that's cool. This is one of the stacks. The smoke flues from the furnaces and converters in the smelter were connected into the main flue that went up to this reinforced concrete stack. It is 153 feet high and the top of this stack was 300 feet above the furnaces, as the volume of sulfurous smoke was tremendous. This concludes our two-day exploration of Antioch, and now on to our next destination. What an amazing and fascinating location, and as a bonus, you can't beat the stunning scenery. I would like to thank my friend Mike and our guide Rob Bryce for this memorable trip. Antioch is privately owned and open to limited people each year. If you're interested in touring Antioch, visit northernbcjetboattours.ca and contact Rob for more details on this and other great adventures. Thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.